I will raise up one and you will crush his head. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. We know that God was talking about his son, Jesus Christ. We know that. And we can see that throughout the scriptures. When God said that, he was pointing to Easter. When God asked Abraham to take his son Isaac up the mountain, and there in the thicket was the sacrificial lamb in place of his son, well, that was pointing to Easter. We know that when Moses held up that bronze snake in the desert so that anyone who would look at it that was bitten by a real snake would live, that was pointing to Easter, absolutely, you're getting the hang of it. There's a few more to go, folks, but be encouraged. When Jacob wrestled with God so that he may be made right with God and have a blessing, that was pointing to Easter. When Joseph was sold into slavery in Egypt and left for dead by his brothers, but it turned out not only good for the family, but for the salvation of the nation, that was pointing to Easter. When Noah built a safe haven, for the preservation of all that would come in when warned of the dangers to come. That was pointing to Easter, when Joshua led the people to the point of freedom, treading and getting their feet wet on the edge of the River Jordan, ready to pass into the Promised Land. That was pointing to Easter, when David uh, appeared to be completely out of his depths in the sight of Goliath, yet took victory over the oppressor, that was pointing to Easter, when Esther was willing to die so her people may live, it was pointing to Easter, when Jonah was swallowed by the whale, only to be to come out three days later, a changed man, it was pointing to Easter, when the psalmist wrote, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast Lots, hundreds of years before that came to be, it was pointing to Easter. When Zechariah wrote, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered, that was explicitly pointing out what would happen to the detail for Easter. And when Isaiah wrote that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Friends, that was pointing to Easter. The whole thrust, the whole movement of the whole Bible, not only that, of the whole of time itself, was pointing towards that pivotal moment that was Easter. We now live on the other side of the cross. And so we can see it. But you know, when people like Abraham and David and Moses and Joshua and great Old Testament heroes, when they tasted glory, it was all still because of Christ. Because salvation is always through Christ. Because time doesn't hold our God, it was always through that pivotal event in history that all were saved, whether they knew the name or not. So I've got a question to ask, and I've got seven answers for you. But don't worry, we will finish at some point this evening. I've got an Agatha Christie to watch. Uh, I've got seven answers, and the, the question is this, and I know it's rhetorical, because I know all of us in here, we know the answers why. So, okay, it's Easter revision. Why was it important that Jesus rose? Why was it important that Jesus rose? Because some people may say, well, th the atonement was able to take place when Jesus died on, on Good Friday. And that's true. Because when Jesus died on Good Friday, he stood in my place. He took my punishment. He took the punishment for all of us who put our faith in him. Because God is just, isn't he? Because God doesn't say your sin doesn't matter. No, it matters so much. But so does his love for his creation. So how is the holiness of God and the love for his creation reconciled? It's in the cross. It's in Christ. So why is it important that Jesus rose? Romans 1, 4 says, Jesus was declared with power 
to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Number one, it proves he really is the Son of God. I'm sure that this morning, or in your quiet times today, or at other points over the weekend, you have thought about, as many of us have all over in different churches, all the evidence, because there is so much that Jesus rose from the dead. And we won't rehearse that again now, but it, it reminds us that he really was who he said he was. Because if he had died and stayed in the grave, think of all the things that he would have said that wouldn't make sense. No, it proves that he really is the Son of God. What about a second answer for you? Acts 24 verse 4 says, But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Number two, it proves he really has overcome death. He really has overcome death. The author C.K. Chesterton famously said, see with what peace the Christian can die. I love that quote. I probably said it here before. See with what peace the Christian can die. And why can so many people of faith in Christ face death with such peace and assurance? Because Jesus has overcome it, friends. The grave could not hold him. And so we know that when we look in our look at our Savior, it's not an abstract idea, but it's the reality of the resurrection. He proves he was really the Son of God. It proves he has really overcome death. What about a third answer? Romans 4:25 says, "He was delivered over to death for our sins, and he was raised to life for our justification." Number three, it proves. He really did die for our sins. He really did die for our sins. I know it's been said many times before, perhaps to the point where it's cliched, but it's so true. You go and find any, any uh, uh, Muslim and you say to them, friend, where's Muhammad? They'll say he's in the grave. Go and find any, any good you know, Jew that's really, really committed to their faith, going to synagogue, obeying the law, and so on, and say, friends, where is Abraham? He's in the grave. Go and find a Buddhist and ask them where Buddha is. He's in the grave. Where's Jesus? He's risen. The tomb is empty. And it's that resurrection which, resurrection which demonstrates to us he really did die for our sins. Because he really is the son of God, he really has overcome death, and it shows us that he really did die for our sins. What about a fourth response? 1 Corinthians 15, 21. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. I know many of you will know of uh, my old Bible college principal, uh, Steve Brady, great man of God, great Bible teacher. And when I graduated, he gave us all a warning. And it stuck with me and concerned me for many years. And it continues to do so as I just think about how right he was. He said, when you go out to teach the Bible, he said, remember that so many people in the church today, uh, his words were confused about their eschatology. What he meant was, is that teaching on heaven and hell is a bit wishy-washy sometimes. No offense, Chris. I know it's not here at MCF. But what I do mean is this, that the idea of heaven, that the biblical perspective is not some sort of abstract idea that we might sit on a cloud and have a harp and, you know, and float around a bit. Jesus had a physical resurrection. And I know that there are a polarity of views on it as well. But as Thomas touched the the hole in his hand and saw the man eat and walk, so can we too, not that we'll know the details because it hasn't happened yet, but we can be confident that we will rise with a new body. I often wonder what age we'll look like. I think I'm at the peak of my physical... You are, you are mean. You are really, really mean. We're going to spend three days on Exmoor together, remember. So, <laughs> Actually, maybe you're right. Maybe there is hope. 
proves it really he really is the son of god it proves he really has overcome death it proves he really did die for our sins it gives us hope of a physical resurrection and it gives us hope of new life now New life now, as Romans 6, 4 says, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Oh, we can. Yes, it doesn't mean that our lives will look like an insurance advert. That insurance adverts wind you up. They do me. If you buy direct line insurance, there will always be daffodils on your table and your children will always be perfectly behaved and everything will be rosy just because you've got a new policy. No, it doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that the God who became incarnate and rose in the grave keeps his promises. And just as he said, he has not left us as orphans. He has given his church, he has given his believers the presence of his Holy Spirit. And we have hope of new life today. Yes, we are pressing on. Yes, we are on a journey, a pilgrimage, whatever word we tend to use. Yes, we hope to see growth in our spiritual life. And I hope to be a greater man in the future than I am today and so on in the word and in the Lord and so on. And you'll understand how I mean that. We pray that for all of us, don't we? That's why we invest in our spiritual life. But we have hope for today. Why? Because the power that raised Christ from the dead can be incarnate in us by his Holy Spirit as we live to walk in his will daily. It proves he really is the Son of God. It proves he really has overcome death. It proves he really did die for our sins. It gives us hope of physical resurrection. It gives us hope of new life now. And penultimately, it gives us confidence that he is still reigning now. Hebrews 1.11 says, Your throne... O oh God, will last forever and ever. I'm sure every generation would say that the news that they hear in the outside world is dire. Perhaps we just hear more of it these days. I don't know. My watch seems to vibrate far too often with some breaking news. Normally it's pretty mundane, but sometimes it's pretty dire too. But Jesus said it would be like this. Not the smart watches, that is, but Jesus did say it would be like that. Jesus said things like, the poor you'll always have among you. didn't say that was a good thing, but he did say that's the way it will be, at least in this age, although not in the age to come, friends, because there are no poor in heaven. No, they're not at all. But it gives us confidence that he is still reigning now because... Jesus, who we call Lord of Lords and King of Kings, is not in a grave. David's in a grave. We all know David's in a grave, as is Solomon, as is Saul, thankfully. You know, but Jesus is not. He is alive. So it gives us confidence. It proves that he really is the Son of God. It proves he has overcome death. It proves he really did die for our sins. It gives us hope for physical resurrection. It gives us hope of new life now. It gives us confidence that he is still reigning now. And then finally, it gives us joy as we live every day with Jesus. It's been my privilege this weekend to have spoken so often I had the privilege of speaking at the Summers and Churches Together Good Friday service and of course this morning at St. Clair's, my home church, and with you this evening and this opportunity again to share that joy. It's a joyous day, isn't it? I hope you felt that. I know you will have done here at MCF, but that resurrection joy is not just for today. It is for all of our lives as we walk with Christ. Yes, with highs and lows and peaks and troughs, but it is for each and every day. It reminds me of that wonderful old joke that I think it was Hell and Pace made once where they said a dog is not just for Christmas. With a bit of luck, there'll be something left over for Boxing Day. <laughs> but your joy is not just for today. With a bit of luck, there'll be more than a left o- bit left over for Easter Monday and into the week to come. Why was it important that Jesus rose? Well, if you haven't picked it up already, it gives us proof of he is who he said he was. He is who he is. Who shall I say sent me? I am, said God. He is who he is. It gives us assurance that he's overcome death. 
It gives us confidence that he has dealt with our sins. It gives us hope of a physical resurrection. It gives us joy of new life today. It gives us certainty that he remains in control of the universe and the Brexit process and everything else in between. He is in control, friends, and it gives us strength that comes from living every day in his spirit. If it weren't for Easter, there would be no Christian faith. Jesus would have appeared like another prophet that came and went, but he wasn't. Because he was and he is the Son of God. And he is the resurrected Lord. And where is he? He's seated at the right hand of the Father, enthroned in glory. He has not left us as orphans. We have our spirit, his spirit with us today because he loves his church. And one day we will be united with him. But in the meantime, that resurrection power that rose him from the grave is available for us to live in today, whether it feels like Monday, Thursday in our lives, or whether it feels like Easter Sunday. And it's for that reason, for all of those reasons, I feel it's very appropriate for us to sing, Thine be the glory, risen conquering Son, endless is the